Hello, everyone at Fantasia. Welcome to the Q&A for Glass House. I was a huge fan of this one. I assume everybody out there in TV land was also a huge fan. I would like to introduce our people. We want to turn on all the lights so we see who's out there, who's out there in Q&A land. We have Emma, Anya, Kelsey, Brett, Greg, Kitty. Bring everyone up. And hey, Greg. All right. So um, this is a very this was a very interesting movie as it explored taboo, the gothic, Afrofuturism, and uh, comes from a great part of the world, uh, South Africa, bringing a view on what, of course, when we first watched it, was it influenced by the pandemic that we're in, Miss Emma. So the timing was really interesting, actually. We we got the go-ahead to write the script from Multi-Choice um, a week before lockdown started in South Africa. So it's I think we got really lucky with the timing on this one, that it sort of vibrated with something that was happening anyway, but it definitely wasn't a response to the pandemic. Although I would say that the experience of writing it in isolation with just Kelsey and I on Zoom all day, every day together, definitely bled into the world for sure and influenced the experience of making it, you know, shooting it during the pandemic with the restrictions that, that came with that. And Kelsey, what was the process of sort of working over Zoom, working virtually, getting this, uh, getting the script locked down? I think the whole the whole process from the concept to delivery of this film was pretty surreal because of the context of the pandemic. But as Emma said, the concept itself wasn't so much informed by it, but the green lighting process was essentially a week before we went into lockdown. So I spent South Africa's lockdown on my balcony, unable to leave my apartment on Zoom with Emma and Greg and, and a co-writer on, on, on another picture as part of the slate. Um, so it was probably a more intimate, insular process than I've ever had before working on a film. But fundamentally, writing is always such a lonely experience. And to be able to like have this meta um, experience of being of, of writing that is often insular and isolating within the context of a larger world event that was so insular and I isolating. I think it really led to sort of um, a, almost more of an inti intimacy and claustrophobia, but not in a negative way when we were exploring this, the ideas in the script. Um, so as Emma said, it definitely, definitely probably influenced our process, maybe more than we're consciously aware of. Um, but my experience of it, honestly, was just gratitude. I was so happy that during a, a time that was so challenging and so stressful and so frightening to sort of have this really close-knit family that I was connecting to every day, that I had this outside contact point with the world doing something that we were really passionate about um, despite the times. That was something I was very, very grateful for. I mean, you, 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 sorry, you get method acting, but I think this was like method writing where we were living out the reality of the characters. And then when we came out of it, when we were finished the script, we were like, okay, world, you know, as you were, return to normal. And then it didn't. And we're like, shit. <laughs> well, because it's following the narrative of your film. I don't think this world ever becomes less toxic and painful, True. yes? It's sort of- yeah, Well, that is the message, right? That's what we learn. It's so it's prophetic. So we want to say that Glass House is the prophecy. And somehow Emma, you were able and Kelsey to sort of lay your hands on the future. And and here we are where the uh, air is poisoned and we're all locked in together in strange family dynamics. Emma, what inspired you to sort of pursue this story, like the germination, the seed, how it came together and uh, sort of like exploring this background when we were, we were off camera a bit. We were talking about your interest in the Gothic and of all things, of course, this has many elements of that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the location really was the starting point for this. Um, so I grew up, I grew up pretty close to this crazy old glass house and it is a very Gothic space. I mean, it was really crumbling. Um, and it's also such a, this is something I think we can touch on later, it's such a colonial relic as well. So, I mean, the history of that gives it a very different meaning in a South African context. So I think we were already interested in it as a space. And then the story 
fell into place around it. So, you know, it started with, here's this isolated memory space. What kind of a story would that engender? Um, because, because the history of the building itself interacts so strangely with the, with the world around it. I mean, it's like, it, here is this relic that was imported from England, you know, this Victorian monument to colonialism, really. Um, and a glass house is this protected atmosphere, this rarefied atmosphere where you can, you can control what comes in and what sort of a world you create within it. You know, the whole point was so these old British people could grow things, grow the flowers of England in these harsh foreign soils. So the space itself was just so rich in terms of investigating our relationship to memory and history. Uh, so that was really, that was the starting point. And then, um, and then the characters and, and, and family story fell in place around, around that as a starting point. Could you- uh, Germination, if you will. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I just had to say germination, if you will. <laughs> yes. There you go. I was just going to go to, just for uh, everyone listening, it's like, what does colonialism mean contextually and nuanced within the South Af African uh, culture country framework? Uh, okay. So, so I mean, we, we were colonized by both the, the British and the Dutch um, with the the British arriving in Kabecha, which is where we, we filmed in, in 1820, and the conservatory itself came, I think, about 18, 1860. Um, and South Africa was under colonial rule for several centuries. Um, and what's really interesting about the, the history of the space where we filmed is it's, it's called frontier country because it, it really is the place where the Osa nation sort of stood up to British rule. So there is a there is a very, um, there's a fraught history there and it's a history that's been written over many times. Um, you know, so we've been through many stages in South Africa. We went through colonialism um, and then we went through apartheid, which really was was given birth to by colonialism. I mean, colonialism created the model for it essentially. And, um, you know, we're in a new democracy now. It's been about, what, it's 25 years now. Um, and we're still really figuring, we're still really figuring it out. Um, and we're figuring out how to, how to live with the memory of that trauma um, in a way that we can still, still function and trust each other as a society. And that has, that has involved a lot of forgiveness on, on the part of those wronged, but also a lot of, um, a lot of amnesia where we're, we're asking people like, please, can we just, pretend like it's okay you know and that I suppose is a lot of what we look at in this is like can you actually bury a trauma can you actually pretend something didn't happen or is it always going to keep back and demanding that it be that it be processed and heard well it seems like in the movie that it's also it's looking at generational and it looks like in a, a re, there's a system of replacement going through the system. So when I watched it as someone from uh, New Jersey, someone from America, I didn't really have this very deep social political read on it, but I feel like what you've given us a little context, like, of course, because this is like generations of ghosts. And I guess uh, when I talk a lot in my world is uh, it's a class system. So this glass house is uh, sort of the bourgeois upper class constantly changing around, finding new people, sort of like there's um, much like the plague in the movie being eternal, but so is this group of people. And they're creating yeah. their own rules of the world. Yeah. And the way that you sustain that, that little paradise within, within a world that's become a wasteland is you dehumanize everyone outside of it. You know, the way they talk about the forgetters as animals that's how the system maintains itself. Um, you know, you're the only real lived human Every, Yeah, everything else is other. Yeah. So um, let's talk to uh, the cast a little bit. How did they come together and sort of, um, was, that, was that a note given to the performance of, of your folks that they're playing in this, in this world, this sort of deep political context? Not at all. Until right now. How did, um, <laughs> surprise, how did everyone become, so you, so, you read the, so you wrote the script, how did the casting process 
happen? How did you find all these great people? They sent really beautiful tapes. Some of them made us cry. They sent, they sent, they sent the most heartfelt, powerful performances and it, in, in ways like where they were channeling these characters and understood the depth of what we were trying to do and the different layers of, of, of who these people were. And, and, and every, pretty much everyone, oh, my dog is joining the Zoom. That's nice. Um, we're all in bed. I don't know if, I don't know if that's obvious, but <laughs> it's, it's 3 a.m. in South Africa. Um, but uh, but uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I still, re I remember very, very clearly all the tapes that came through. And it was, it was a challenging casting process. We got, a, we got I think, over 120 tapes for every, every role. Um, everyone was in lockdown, so everyone had a lot of time to submit tapes. And, and, but the, the, the performances that came through of everyone on this call were just, I mean, riveting. And, and the moment we saw them, it was sort of like, well, I mean, there you go. What was it about uh, Kitty's tape that made you feel that she could sort of play the Wednesday Adams Jr. Leatherface of the family? Who, well, of course, I super resonated as did a uh, cat who did your write up in uh, in Fantasia with her body parts and her little tea party friends. I mean, so many things. I, 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 Kitty is wise beyond her years. But she manages to capture that sort of um, precocious, I will say whatever I feel in the moment um, quality that, that is inherent to children, but with an honesty and authenticity with everything she does, that is just an absolute treasure to work with. Um, I mean- Savage innocence is what, we, is what we called it when we were looking for it. And it was so clear immediately that it was, it was Kitty. And I think her casting is possibly the most key because if, because she's the youngest, she creates the world. And her complete buy into the savagery of this, it's, you know, her just being a child playing at a tea party, but it's a corpse she's playing with, is is what gives you the cue to what kind of a world this is. Um, and so I think we just got so lucky that that this kind of talent exists in such a young person. Kitty, I don't know, I can't, I don't know if it's just me, but I can't see your video. Are you, are you there with us, stuff? There she is. Strange. I see your video. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. cool. Just me then. <laughs> Just me. So, so Kitty, what do you have to say for yourself for creating such like this savage innocence and how much um, fun it was on set to play with uh, dead bodies? Well, well, I wasn't really scared of like all the blood and gore, but well, it's my debut. So it was all new. Everything was all new and so fun. Like every day on set, it was really fun. And yeah, that was probably one of my favorite scenes with the corpse and the blood and watching the makeup it was really amazing how did you um i was just gonna ask like uh, what was your process in creating uh the character and then also on set being directed by emma well like healthy like sorry Daisy, she brings like innocence to the story like when i read the script i was the only child i didn't when i got in i was like oh i'm the only child who's been cast and then I read it and she brings innocence in like this world of where it shows that she's lived in her life and she knows no different than the gas and being there with corpses. It's like her normal everyday life. And directing her, Kelsey? Oh, Kelsey's a really good director. She's an amazing director. And well, I guess I, I loved getting notes from Kelsey but, and I really loved taking them because she directs, she died. She just directs everyone so well, and yeah. You're very kind to me, Kitty. You made it very easy. So Anya, tell us about your character, who is sort of refuses to forget. Is very strong, but in the end, it sort of has like a, such an interesting, an interesting arc. So tell me about your your process as an actor. Yeah, yeah. Um... <clears throat> Evie, <laughs> Evie was an interesting one. Um, Evie very much had like this uh, from, yeah, I think my initial, initial, very initial take on it. And I think maybe um, Emma and Carlos can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's maybe one of the first uh, big things that like uh, clicked for them on their side. 
um, is that like I really just felt such a connection to this internal struggle that Evie has going on like 24 hours a day. <laughs> this girl is stressed. <laughs> um, you know, she's she's constantly having to keep wraps. She's making sure, you know, mother's the mother, you know, um, Adrian's character is actually the, the big, you know, she's w- what she says goes. But for Evie, Evie is the one that's under the radar, always trying to keep everything together and keep everything safe and um, um, keep calm. Uh, But so, so, so it was such an interesting character for me to be able to play because it's just a constant internal battle, constant internal struggle, um, constant worry um, on everyone's behalf. And I think I really related to that part of her initially, like um, within my self tapes, I think, because it was so crazy. I think I got the tape, I I got the audition and I had to like have the tapes in like the next day because it was such a rush. Um, And I just spent the whole day sitting with this character and this was like the first thing that hit me. And I really related to it because within my life, I've had a lot of internal battle and internal struggle. So um, but it was also interesting because now you're putting all of this in a situation like that, not in the everyday, I'm just living my normal life and normal world situation. So, um, yeah, I think I really relate to that part of Evie. From a, from a, from a sort of like tech standpoint, the way Evie's mm. character is and the, and the mother, how does that sort of align social politically with, with the theme of uh, colonialism, the idea of the matriarch, the one that has, the clear-headed story but is that story clear-headed um yeah that's a that's a that's a doozy (laughs) um (laughs) well well i mean i think um i i think that so much of this is about um telling the story that you can live with and it's not necessarily the mm. true one, but it's the one that's that's most sustainable. And that, um, you know, that's I guess the arc that Anya had, that uh, that Evie has is is realizing that that sometimes truth needs to be sacrificed for continuity, um, which is essentially what the creation of history is. You know, it's it's choosing what can we live with, um, what's bearable. And so we have sort of on the opposite spectrum of that, which is very fascinating, is uh, Jessica, your character. The idea is someone who is uh, so is almost is almost someone who is living in the fantasy, and the idea is that the arc to just go truly into uh, oblivion, in a sense, also sort of matching with uh, Brett's character, who we'll get to. So, uh, Jessica, tell me a little bit about your character sort of putting that together. And also, of course, we can talk about our lovely Kelsey as director. Yeah, um, I mean, B, I was very taken by B when I read the script. I mean, I've never read a character like B. Um, and it was definitely, for me, like well out of my comfort zone, I think, when I when I took the role. Like I knew, Kelsey made me feel like, I know I can do it. She's very good at that. <laughs> She, she makes you, she pushes you out of your comfort zone to a point that, you know, it's a lot sometimes, but then the results come and you see why she did it. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was definitely a challenge. I mean, she's, she's a very unique character. She, you know, like you say, she sort of willingly pushes herself into oblivion and you see that, especially towards the end of the movie. And it's quite heartbreaking. Um, and I guess like going, continuing sort of with the like running metaphor and um, symbolism you're talking about with colonialism and everything, it's like, that's that kind of like, I suppose that side of it um, in terms of there are a lot of people that will for ease, you know, ignorance is bliss, you know, will for ease just go into oblivion and suppress, um, you know, things that they would otherwise have to deal with in their life that is difficult, which B obviously does in the movie and it has, a huge impact on her and her family um and yeah but she's you know she's a very sweet character I have a lot of love for B. she you know is away with the fairies a little bit and um Kelsey always would describe her as like a butterfly like she has like a butterfly bu- butterfly brain um which is like a buzzword I feel like we kept coming back to on set like 
she'd be like remember the butterfly that's in you you know and it was just sort of that idea of the way her brain can just switch from one mood and one thought just completely to something else like the wings of a butterfly just so um just flitty and yeah and that was definitely something I'd say the thing I probably had to work on the most in terms of building the character um was those like weird chops that she does in mood but I think with all of the characters I, I don't know if I speak for everyone when I say it but I feel like a lot of the characters like we all they all sort of grew and became their own thing like as we were shooting it as well even though it's obviously all very strong in the script but like you know I mean watching these guys on set you just honestly watch some of the performances and you're like in this scene trying to remember your lines but I'm just watching absolute madness unfold before my eyes I'm like trying not to cry watching someone do something like um yeah it's quite surreal. yeah we had a lot of emotional scenes yeah yeah, yeah. I would say it's heavy, important. heavy stuff. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah. And in terms of Kelsey, just, she's just great. She's just 10 out of 10. she's facing everyone else, I'd just like to to throw some, some praise Jess's way because the thing is this character could so easily have felt shallow and vapid because she chooses to live in that butterfly space. But it really is the butterfly sitting on top of the tar pit. And Jess brought such weight and depth to it with the sense of, a strong sense of all of these suppressed traumatic memories always bubbling under the surface so that there was there was always a really grounded and and difficult depth to it that it was never it never just felt felt light or, or, or shallow what i thought was very interesting and sort of relates to what's going on of course with the pandemic and social media and a lot of the false news the idea with jessica you said sort of ignorance is bliss but also in this movie it's like is incredibly dangerous is that you could bliss out so much and forget out so much to the destruction of the self to the destruction of the family so yeah to forget, there there is and as you said butterfly it's very interesting because it's a butterfly effect how that blissing well, out exactly moves throughout the movie moves throughout the family as things get uh moved uh moved around for uh mm-hmm I just, yeah, so I just, um, what I, I, I just like to speak to this because I think it's very easy to talk about and lean into the dangers of amnesia and how important pre preservation of history is to not re repeat the mistakes of the past and, and all of those ideas that we're so familiar with in terms of being haunted by traumatic events and recognizing that you can't turn away from them, that you have to face them heads on. And that's very much Evie's approach as a character um, in preserving identity and preserving the family and feeling like she has to be to shoulder the burden of these memories. Yeah. But with that said, and what I was so fascinated by in sort of the dynamic between these two characters is that sometimes pain and trauma can be such a heavy burden that it can be so impactful in the present that you can barely cope or survive or move forward. You're consistently drowning and pulled back in, in the, into that tar pit. And I think what B was fighting so fiercely for is to live to live a full life and not be completely defined or shaped by the trauma of her past. And I think there's something to be said for that too. And, and that's what, that's what was such a pleasure in like diving into the story and the ideas that we, we were exploring. And, and even from the very beginning is, and, and Emma and I had so many conversations about this, that sometimes you have experiences in your life that are very traumatic, that change you and shape you. And it's all well and good to be like, Oh, it, you know, it just makes you stronger and, you know, it just gives you more depth. But the real reality of trauma is that it can change your life forever and change who you are and not necessarily for the better. It doesn't, you know, magically make you this stronger, more in-depth person. Sometimes it, it brings a lot of pain and, and heaviness to your life and, and PTSD and whatnot. And if you had the option to not be changed in those ways, I think a lot of people might choose it. And is that so wrong? To, 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 to not have to carry the burden of certain experiences. And I, and I, and I loved um, the depth that, uh, the weight that, that Jess brought to that because it, it's, it's too easy to say, well, Evie's the true strong one because she, she's the one willing to carry this burden and not turn away from it. But the argument that B is making is like, will you sacrifice the happiness and will you sacrifice the happiness and the solidarity of this family because you're hanging on to a memory that actually divides us? And so we have on the spectrum sort of the idea of Brett. Hello, Brett down there and your character. Can you tell us a little bit about your character in the film and also your, um, your, your audio is off? 
and then hey hi so um, little, yeah so tell me a little bit about your uh character and working with uh kelsey and sort of talk as we're talking about sort of amnesia and truth sort of like you're almost like the the uh the true innocence when we when the audience meets you in in the film yes so gabe um he doesn't really have a memory um so he's always trying to remember things of his past when he was younger and um the way that i played the role um, I couldn't really react to facial expressions and like uh, have a normal conversation with someone. So I was always in my head, mostly just looking down. So I was really just actually like uh, reacting to, I call it like the room temperature, but it was always like humid and everything, but like um, just reacting to the, the, the tone of the scene. Um, uh, if if something doesn't feel comfortable, he will show it. He, everything that he does, he does it with uh, true honesty, and he, he can't keep it in. So when he's angry, he will show it to usually to the mother because she's the leader leader of the of the family. Um, and yeah, so everything was just reacting to other people and the situation in this claustrophobic area. Yeah. And working mm -hmm. with with Kelsey, uh, I spoke to her uh, in the beginning and said, like, uh, I think we have to uh, keep this on a more personal level. So uh, she gave me a lot of space to explore and whatever. But after the scene, we'll just have a little chat about what what actually happens in this, um, because I could uh, really Gabe can <clears throat> can go from very happy to very sad in one moment. And there's not a lot of, um, I don't know, not dialogue, but um, in the in the scenes, there's a lot of gaps because he doesn't say anything, but it's always there. So it's always there in the corner or something. So I can actually decide what he's feeling at the moment. Um, and yeah, so I got a lot of personal space to figure that out. And what's very interesting is when the Luca character enters the film that you become the scapegoat, the innocent becoming a scapegoat, also sort of a word that we see sort of like in toxic family dynamics in a sense, right? Yeah. Now, that. now Greg, how did you get involved with all these, these uh, crazy folks? <laughs> nice, caught me off guard quite nicely there. I'd almost gone nice. back to sleep. <laughs> We'll get to you. Um, you matter. <laughs> well, Kelsey and I have known each other, uh, geez, about four or five years now. And uh, we were talking about the, the shows and um, part of just being involved from the germination of the idea and the pitching sessions between her and Emma. And uh, we just kind of grew from there. But it was definitely through Kelsey that I was introduced to this crazy bunch. Um, and and yeah, we just as we said, we went through the process of developing the screenplays and giving my five cents, and uh, then went into shooting that in in lockdown. So that's kind of how I got involved or was involved. What did you think about the the sort of uh, subject matter during the process of doing it, but also the prophetic nature now that it's come out and we're still in a world of COVID and poisoned air. Um, it was actually quite interesting because it, it didn't. This we did three um, stories, and, and Glasshouse wasn't my favorite until the screenplay was written. And there was like, okay, God, we got to get this going. And it switched from being that nah, it's, it's, it's okay to to really being my favorite uh, screenplay because it, it worked so well. And then we got to the the permission for the location. And that was when everything just started to really gel. And it, it was quite interesting because we got there and we had to unfence the, the, um, the glass house to, to basically free the glass house for us to go and live in this little bubble that was created under the COVID uh, protocol. So living on set was, was kind of like living in this little house that you'd just freed 
telling the story of a family that are trapped in that house <laughs> by the, the probes around it. So when you kind of take the step back and you have your early morning coffee, you realize that it, it's, it's quite a bizarre scenario that we're working in. And it, it was just really unexpected. I think it would have been a different mood if it had been filmed under different circumstances. Um, it, it just made everyone focus on, on being in that space at that time. Yeah, Greg, what Greg's far, far too humble to say is that we wouldn't have made this movie without him. Um, we wouldn't have been able to. It was sort of a miracle that we were able to enter production um, and, and make this movie happen in the way that we did as quickly as we did. I mean, the turnaround from concept to script to production was I, a couple of months. I mean, it was just insane. So that in itself was, a, you know, a colossal effort and, and miraculous, particularly in 2020 of all years. And then I'm really, Greg, I'm so glad you brought up the unfencing because that, that's, that's like one of those little anecdotes that, you know, you almost forget about. But the, the whole Pearson Conservatory was surrounded by um, a, a massive fence, um, like, like completely blocked in to protect it, <laughs> to protect this relic of colonialism from, from vandalism. <laughs> and and we tore the fence down. We removed it for the film. It was like our first act of, of arrival and, and starting to dress the set um, or clear it, make way for art department to get to work was bringing down that fence. And we had to restore it when we left. Talk about levels of symbolism. I mean, the whole experience was so meta. <laughs> no, it definitely it definitely wouldn't have been made without Greg. Greg is is the true hero, and the fact that he he took a chance on this weird story and these weird girls, Kelsey and I, um, I feel very happy about. But I think um, I think the fact that we had to do it with such a small cast and crew because the lockdown regulations meant we couldn't have more than fifty people on set. I actually think that it ended up working in our favor. So a lot of the things that that look like, um, you know, that looked like they were going to make our lives a lot harder brought the crew together, kept it small, kept it feasible, um, kept us light on our feet because we were all working at great pace, knowing that if one person on the crew got sick, we were probably screwed, you know, and we'd have to shut down production. So we, it just, it kept everyone really, really focused. And also, Greg, I, I think you don't like people so much, I th so I think maybe under 50 is, is preferable for you anyway. It is, absolutely. <laughs> And then we were actually also very fortunate to get Jess into the country in, in a window where, you know, I think she only had to go home and sit in isolation for five days prior to it becoming 10 or 15 or whatever it is now. Um, it, it was just everything just aligned. So, yeah, kind of prof prophetic, but also very fortunate in, in happening. Sorry. When it did, I mean, I got, a, I got a renewed passport, like... <laughs> A few oh, days crikey, before yes. I left the UK, oh my God, was <laughs> I had to go to the embassy. I had to go to the embassy in London on the last day that they were open before they closed again for lockdown. Booked an appointment, which obviously meant absolutely nothing. You just had to wait there for hours, and finally got this flipping passport through. Even down to a few hours before my flight, I didn't have my COVID result. So it was like really when Emma greeted me at the airport, she had balloons. She was like, "You made it." We did not think this was gonna happen. It was like really hard. And they're like protecting me from the shit show of how hard it was. Yeah, really exactly. Like, she doesn't need to know. She needs to focus. So, yeah, Kelsey honestly, was left if, in the dark. If Jess, if you hadn't been such a rock star, it it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened. Um, well, I'll never I think forget. We, I'll never I'll never forget being on Recky with Justice, our, our cinematographer. And we were in the glass house and we were like in the middle of like shot listing and then Emma messages me and we've, we've just gotten it announced that this UK, that the UK embassy is closing because it was all, it all happened really, really quick when, when the UK went into lockdown over that period and I think October. And, and we were like, mm. oh my God, we have to get Jess there. And then I was just calling Jess being like, um, yeah, can you, are you available like today to be at the embassy? Like, like now? hidden suppressed panic. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you made it but no it all worked out well and adding on to what Emma was um, saying what you guys were saying also about obviously filming it with like a small crew like I think it added a lot also to just like as an actor what it was like for our performances and I think what it was like for all of us on set it was like very very intimate you know and we were in that glass house for hours on end that thing was hot sweaty like everyone is dripping kind of hot like 
you know, especially on Sundays, it would get very overwhelming and everyone would kind of just stay in there and just kind of sit in it. It kind of made us lose our mind a little bit in a good way because it took us out of ourselves. And I think everyone was going through that experience, actors and crew alike. And um, it was nice not having loads of people about. It's like, you know, small group of people. And it's easier to sit in the world that you're pretending to be in. It suddenly feels real. We're all walking around barefoot all the time. I had mud, uh, mud under my nails the whole four weeks. You know, I probably barely washed. Honestly, it was a real journey. <laughs> method Jess method yeah method you couldn't it was method was forced upon us in this film I was so sweaty it wasn't a choice <laughs> no but I think that kind of safe and intimate environment allowed us to get the honesty of the performances we did and particularly I just wanted to say to to Brent's performance it's it, he is one of the most honest present actors I've I've ever seen and it was a difficult role to the extent that um Kelsey and I were saying the other day, if we had to go back and write the script, we would have been braver with the role because we were so worried while we were writing it about representation and were we actually going to be able to find someone to cast who could carry this. And Brent is an angel from heaven. He's so emotionally intelligent. Um, and it was such a gift to be able to, to trust that role to. Yeah, I wish you could have a- seen like Brent, I wish I could have like transplanted you from your performance and let you hover like a ghost behind the monitor sometimes because you know, he, oftentimes in the scenes, because because he would go from these emotional states so swiftly um, with such nuance, he was, a lot of people behind the monitor would be crying in reaction to his performances. It, it, it was, it was, it was quite something. And, and um, like Brent, you really, you really did such special work and you're quite a, you're quite an impact. Yeah, I will even just say from, being the perspective of a fellow cast member watching him and like being in scenes with him was really wild very very emotional yeah like many times that I think we all kind of like choked up a little bit and Kelsey would call Kat and we'd all just be like what was that that was yeah. insane yeah. yeah and you'd literally be in awe like I remember us like literally just standing on the side and every, there's just a silence would set in and everyone would just be so in awe of what just came out of this man. Like just this emotion that you just don't expect. Um, yeah, it was, was, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think honest, from, from, from being outside and sort of watching you guys work, your the way that you, the, the intimacy translated to the performances and that insanely claustrophobic environment you guys all ended up capturing so, I mean, I, it was it was actually, I can't tell you, it's like co-writers with Emma and I, we would go away and we talk about you behind your back of just how we couldn't believe how exquisitely you were capturing the energies of what we had hoped for, that we had envisioned on the page. And that doesn't always happen. Oftentimes, you know, an actor will bring something that you didn't even see or didn't even think of that's absolutely brilliant. You're like, oh my God. Um, and you guys all did that as well. But but in terms of really capturing the heart, the individual heart that we had hoped for each of these characters, we were so lucky because um, ac- across the board, it was everything we'd hoped for. So thank God. Thanks for being great. I was saying as an audience member, because I know it's like maybe the colonial family and uh, social politically wouldn't be such a family that I loved, but all the performances, I really felt for who they were. But until, and this is a very, this is a very important question. I knew right away when, a, when the boy showed up that this was not going to be good. But I feel that that's like woman's intuition. When like mm. fake Luca, it's like, oh no, a boy has showed up in, a, in, a, in the household of women. What chaos will happen? Which, which aligns a little bit with uh, the beguiled, but in a different way. Because the problem is with this false Luca and not necessarily in the hearts of the women. So I wanna hear a little bit about thematically about that and sort of, because it was just, it was hard for me to love this this Luca character because I knew he's no good. Fair enough. I think, you know, it's, it's worth, oh, Emma, are you on mute? No, you're not. I think it's worth quickly mentioning that, Emma, had you seen the Bug Isled? Because I, I hadn't, I, I, should, I should guiltily admit, I hadn't seen it when we were writing. 
and 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 it was referenced. Oh. It was brought up. Was just, what no, was that? I was that? just going to say that was one of the reference films. Yeah, it was directorially. For for because the director, I kept watching it. But but the then I watched it. <laughs> yeah. So so it was it was such a backwards process because it was like we were writing the script and then we were getting comments of like, oh, this is a lot like The Beguiled. And I was like, oh, I really should watch that. <laughs> so I know why people keep saying that. And then when we finished writing the script and then I watched the film and then it was like, oh, oh, I see. And 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 we knew that it was going to be an inescapable reference. And, 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 it, and it is very, very apt. Um, like with the plot parallel of a male stranger invading a matriarchal space, and they and you know both films tackle manipulation and in in, in, in gendered form, right? Um, but I was relieved when I finally watched the film that Glasshouse diverged so dramatically um, from that initial intrusion in terms of the way the stranger treated. Um, his time with the woman in terms of how all of that was handled in terms of the woman's choices. Um, there are definite similarities, but I was, yeah, I was, I was, you know, cause you never want to end up like write something and be all proud of it and think you're all unique and original and then watch something brilliant and be like, oh shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I, I also look, I, I think, I know the stranger is a difficult character to relate to because you do get such a sense of like, okay, he's stepping into this harmonious, fairly harmonious space and he's going to, he's going to destroy it. But I think in the context of the world that we built out, outside of the glass house um, and they're really, we don't see it. So there's only a few hints of it, but it's, it's hell out there. It, it really is. I mean, he's living in a, in a world where he's watched everyone that he knows forget him. He's entirely alone. And probably the only interactions he has with anyone is people trying to rape or eat him. So, you know, you understand and can empathize with why he is so desperate for what this family has. Um, yeah, Hilton, Hilton, we had a lot of conversations and, and did a lot of, I think, preliminary character work. And, and we had a lot of conversations during rehearsals about what his life was like before he ever crossed the threshold and how to try to hint at that through the subtext of how he engages with the family. And as much as he is immediately seen as a threat and the potential for threat is unavoidable and like, oh, how is this kind of going to shake things up? From his perspective and his experience of the world and what he's been through is so horrific. We talked a lot about, can you really blame someone for wanting to keep something so precious that they've never been able to have once they discover that it is in, in this reality. Because before he arrives at the glass house, I don't think he even knew that there was anyone left like that, that had that, that was as cognizant or had a semblance of memory. His experience as being completely isolated and alone and other himself in a world where he had, would just consistently watch loss and pain. And, and through that, like, I mean, he's a, we, we intentionally, when we were writing, we wanted to keep the question open for as long as possible. Like, do we like this character? Do we trust this character? Is this character someone that we can get behind or is it someone that we loathe? And I'd actually love to ask, I mean, from your perspective watching it, because we're so close to it, at what point, what, what was your take on him at the end? Like spoilers, but it doesn't matter now. Like, did you, did, you, did you love him? Did you hate him? Did you feel like his choices were justified? I, well, I of course am a uh, punk rock individual. So I'm, I'm a super girl power. And I know the idea is like when you're going into sort of a, a matriarchal space, the idea is that he just wanted to go and he was, he was entitled He's a male, so he's an entitled male, so I'm entitled to this. And if we sort of want to go back to the idea of social political, it's almost like a capitalist drive. It's like, you have this, I'm entitled. I want it. So I'm going to take it. I'm going to take all the girls, they're going to be mine. I am now um, uh, on Anya's character, maybe the head of the household, but I would argue that in the future, it's like that this Luca would then become in charge and we would go back to sort of like a traditional gender role of when the male shows up this is now my story this is now my family that was my read on it uh toward towards the uh towards the end even though all the eroticism was super hot <laughs> i was like well that's good <laughs> it, yes i'm just saying so so pl playing on that 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 you know getting that out of the performance and, and the character is that I, I, he was never able to get me on the side because of that entitlement. But I also feel sort of like is, you know, 
female filmmakers, a lot of these performances are nuanced and probably seen through the, the lived eyes of, of the social political nature of being a female and seeing in society and meeting these people in my life, which is very interesting when you talk about the beguile, the idea is like, here's a woman's space that a man invades, the idea that this is probably a story that has been told so many times. And it also, your movie though, not in tone, but like a distant, distant cousin, and especially like, you know, uh, Kitty's character, like probably decorating with all the bones. It is it is almost like a Victorian Afrofuturism reverse of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh. The idea that they're going into this, into this oh. feral family home, but now it's all women. And because it's women, it's like, it's lace. It's decorative. We hang our bones up in our beautiful ways. We have tea parties with our corpses. So I did see a little bit of that. I think, yes, when like when Kitty was hanging up the bones, it reminded me of Chainsaw. Of course, my my favorite horror movie of all time. I love like that. Like the girl version of it. I want that, I want that that quote on the on the poster. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Victorian, uh, Victorian Afrofuturist Texas Chainsaw. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Look, Great elevator pitch. It was brutal for us and we struggled with it because we don't love the messaging of it, but it's also unfortunately pragmatically how dystopias play out. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not just, it's not just the stranger taking the dominant position at the end. It's, it's Gabe's erasure as well. You know, Gabe who represents another, another type of masculinity. Um, and well, it's, we talked it's, to, mm, yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm going to finish. No, go for it, babe. Uh, just, it just on that note, it was so easy. It would have been so easy to craft the ending as if it was the stranger's complete takeover. And I think what's almost more disconcerting and what I found, you know, what resonated with me the most was Evie's complicity to that, that she makes the decision to accept and not even forgive, but just tolerate what he's done because the value of, of welcoming him to the family in the end becomes in her mind, the narrative, sorry, my dog is joining in and in her mind, the narrative that is going to protect the family the most effectively. And we watch that shift in her over the course of the film. And yes, he does have an effect on her and you can say manipulates her. But in the end, it was really important to show that this was a choice she makes. She, when, when, when B sacrifices herself for the last time and you know chooses oblivion, she's like, well, I've been abandoned now again. And this is a person from the outside who's saying that he doesn't wanna be forgotten. He wants to be known for who he truly is. He's someone that in this world, because of his gift, because the toxin doesn't affect him, I can count on. So fundamentally, he has the skill and the ability to, to be the thing that she's constantly grasping for and grasping. No! And that's what he recognizes in her as well, right? That, that in each other, they have the thing that they've been seeking as much yeah. as there's so many reasons for her to, to loathe him. And I think like that sort of power dynamic we found fascinating. It was really important that with the ending, that it was still Evie pulling the strings, manipulating the spider web of, of crafting the narrative. To have a family. Yeah, exactly. That the family and, and, the, and having a family becomes Trump's all else. Yeah. Can we, can we talk a little bit, bit about the sexuality in the film? Which is, of yes. a, 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 <gasps> we've reached it. We've reached the incest part of the conversation. I'm excited. All right, so putting it in the film, crafting it as a narrative, and then playing it out in such uh, intimate, intimate scenes with your with your actors, and also an incredible, uh, brave performance with uh, Brett and Anya. I think that's a very strong scene, and I I don't think I've ever seen that in any in any film. Also, that can that you can look at it as it feels like the, the a lot of the sex in the in the film comes from a very compassionate place for both of the characters. I'm so glad it reads that way. See you guys, it worked. Um, <laughs> no, it, it was, that, that scene was um, <laughs> definitely one that we were, we knew it was pivotal to the film to get it right. Mm. But I think Anya and, and Brent, talk about your experience because we had so many conversations leading up to that scene. And I know it was scary. <laughs> Oh shit! Well, no, Brett. It was, 
it was a um, a big one for both of us um and that was also my that was my first um on screen intimate scene that I'd ever done um obviously there was it wasn't kissing but it was very intimate on a different kind of level um I know for myself I was I was I was very um, got a front there um I was very nervous uh but I think Brent made it very Brent gave I think we both just really threw ourselves into it um and also the fact that we were both so nervous and like awkward about it, I think really helped for it to read well because it was just authentic emotion <laughs> in that moment. Um, so I, we could both really feed off of that, like w- what we were feeling. I, I, um, Brent, I don't know if you want to like comment on how you felt um, during that scene, but I know for myself, I was, and I know for Evie's character, it's like she, she just, despised you know every second of this but this is also she loves his character so much and it's the only way she knows how to soothe him um and once again this just like an internal battle um but it was truly just such an awkward scenario yeah. so I think we both just fed off of that yeah I think um Kelsey really uh prepared us for it so yeah. we had a lot of steps to do and we counted out everything and mm-hmm. I think that helped a lot so to make it more practical like a dance almost and not a yeah. sex scene and just yeah, very like very choreographed step for very step yeah. yeah and I think helps. that made it very simple it's a simple task and just go yeah. and do it yeah I think that would... yeah like we, like I said we just threw ourselves mm-hmm. into it and we were just like yeah. hitting those beats um and I think yeah I'm super glad to hear that it read what well, like yeah that it read so well <laughs> what I'm so happy to see is this this movement um in films towards treating intimacy uh as choreography or as as mm. scripted conversational content because especially in a world like this and for a character like Gabe who's lost his words um physicality is communication and this is the thing is sex and intimacy is just one tool that they have to communicate with each other and with the outside world's taboo of what sex means or who you should or shouldn't be having sex with with that stripped away it's really just a way of loving and caring for each other and 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 checking in um so I think um I think Kelsey was really great with that with with working it through so that the so that the intimacy was as in as vital a part of the script as the dialogue is and yeah. treating it in that way. Thanks, Emma. I think with, with any sex scene, I mean, I mean, they're so awkward and you want to take out any form of personal awkwardness that can get in the way of the performance. So when with all the sex scenes, we approached it like choreography as if we were choreographing a dance and we worked out in advance as step-by-step what, what would the natural progression be? Like authentically, what would you do next? And we had those conversations, you know, as a dialogue very, very openly and then did those physical steps and then worked out what it was going to be so that there was no surprises that could um, jolt the performance away from itself so that once we were in that space, and the hope, I mean, you can, guys can tell me if it worked, but the hope was that you could be free and stay in a safe space to experience yeah. all of the things and all of the emotions yeah. without worrying about, um, about what was going to happen next physically. Yeah, I can say that Carl's definitely, um, uh, and everyone, I mean, um, Emma, Carl's like, everyone was so, so amazing at making us as, as the performers just feel safe in the space, which allowed us to really just go for it and, um, you know, and follow, just follow that choreography, true choreography truthfully and honestly. And like, uh, Carl's, I like what she said now um, in terms of like, there were no surprises. Um, so none of us were caught off guard and, and, and there was no, it was awkward, but it was, there was nothing to, um, veer us off of um, track in terms of performance. Um, everything was just so, was, uh, everything was very safe and done in such a manner that like, yeah, it was it was actually, yeah, as pleasant as it could have been. 
Shame. Jess, Jess, you had a bit of a doozy as well with your with your first um, seat. Um, I don't know if you Yes. <laughs> Where do we start with the woodshed? Um oh, Yeah, woodshed. I <laughs> that was also my first um intimate scene beyond just a kiss. And you know, for your first scene to be bent over in a woodshed um, for a few hours on a Tuesday morning was an interesting uh, start to that part of my career. It was... By a couple of different people. By a couple of different people. (laughs) (laughs) One of them being Hilton, um, who I obviously knew quite well by that point. But the other two, we were able to be acquainted a couple of days before. But it was... uh, (laughs) Yeah, it was was strange. But, like, honestly, you know, it's like everyone else said, you know, it's... uh, it was awkward, but kind of in a funny way. And you kind of just get on with it. And, you know, it was, you know, very well choreographed, beat for beat. You know, exactly where every sort of touch was going to come in or whatever. And um, I think the other thing about sex and intimacy in the film, which I feel like we spoke about a lot and was a good place for me to go anyway with B's relationship with sex, is because they're in this world, just within the glass house, you know, sex isn't, necessarily it's not the same way we look at it in the world we all live in now you know like this this lustful thing that everyone sort of thirsts after I think for for they they have almost that just like primal animalistic instinct to do sexual things because they have these bits and they're like becoming young women and you know and so it's just like the natural curiosity is there except without the societal you know norms and support you know it's not like they can go and watch some porn and like figure it out they kind of just like fumble around and like have a go themselves with the people that they have available to them um so I think that's what stops it obviously from being gratuitous at any point or just you know over the top you know it's it was um yeah all done in earnest and um yeah I mean it was weird but fun in a weird way you know I I love that you brought up the societal taboo Jess because I mean it, it's it's uh, frankly it's such a gift to be able to explore female sexuality in a context where you don't have sort of a stereotype of what is the right way to behave well, or yeah. that you should be judged or have a response even coming down to, to um shaving like yeah Kelsey yeah exactly. Kelsey said you know I didn't shave you know I mean I'm not a massive shaver anyway <laughs> to be perfectly honest but like the whole time obviously we were there like I said we were barefoot and everything and like Kelsey expressed to me like don't bother shaving your legs or your armpits like it doesn't make sense for this world that they're in like these women are going to wake up and be like oh my gosh it's be super unsexy if I go out and kill the people outside and plant all the plants today with my hairy armpits you know must get those shaved so that was quite a liberating exploration of you know another side of female sensuality and whatnot that Kelsey encouraged. I think what was um what was so awesome to explore in this world is like what does a dystopian sci-fi future look like in which women's sexuality is explored in a way that is not focused primarily on their vulnerability. I was chatting to Kelsey about this the other day. I feel like so many dystopians that I that I watch as soon as you're introduced to a female character the anxiety starts of like oh when is she going to get raped as you know world or character building and the story is so much about the world's fallen apart and therefore these women are vulnerable within it and it was so exciting to be able to to tell a story in which they have created their own sanctuary and their own safe space and they're thinking not just about um how to stay alive in the world but how to rebuild it and how to make a safe space for themselves within it and using their reproductive powers to give them agency rather than object status right so, and but how any form of desire is so entirely unapologetic because there's no context for feeling shame or questioning those impulses and, and they haven't been taught to question that and I think that was quite a pleasure to be able to play in that space is a glass house in its sense almost uh, a cage I know just brought up the idea of sort of like the feral nature of the sexuality I mean, the glass house is certainly a trap. 
um, on, on, on multiple levels, but I think the metaphorical and the, and the, the painfully literal, right? I mean, but it's also their sanctuary and, and the irony of the, of, the, of the thing that is enabling your survival also being the thing that constrains you. And I think that was a push and pull that we were consistently exploring and, and you know, as much as we could in every scene, but because it, it completely shapes their personalities, it completely shapes their identity and their sense of self, but also their conception of the world and, and their, and how they view themselves within this post-apocalyptic landscape. Can you talk about the world building, the details of the clothing, the almost like steampunk, you know, containment units to go outside and just this, the type of storytelling techniques that the, um, the uh, stained glass, the dolls, all those sort of details and aspects, because it's like, it, we know it's the future, but it's also simultaneously the past. And there's also sort of like a feminine quality to this sort of storytelling, delicate techniques of these girls in the glass house. Just the conceptualization of the world building thematically. I think, yeah, that's a brilliant question. Thank you so much. Um, I think what, there was never a question in my mind that these women needed to be dressed in a way that had was Victorian influenced. There was also, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll get to the logic behind that in a moment. There was also the, the pragmatic approach of we don't want to kill everyone in this very humid environment. <laughs> so, so having them and like, I like, I know if I lived in a glass house, I would just be throwing on a shift every day and, and, and we'd be wearing the bare minimum. So we, we were trying to acknowledge the, 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 the practical element of what, what they'd be most comfortable in. But, but from the Victorian influence, and that sort of gothic sensibility, it was a couple of things. One, when we finished writing the script, we were, it, it was like, we had this moment, I'll never forget, we're in Emma and we're like, we've just written a fairy tale. And we hadn't really thought about that in the writing. Like even doing the once upon a time story, we hadn't acknowledged or verbally discussed that we were writing a fairy tale, but it was so obvious that that's like, that, that that's what it was, that we were like in this timeless place, no, neither here nor there, but identifiable, um, as this sort of in-between place, meeting of, of, of past and future. Um, and then from the Victorian context point of view, there's so much about the Victorian period that symbolizes constraint and sort of a facade of what the female should be, what the feminine should be in, in terms of like, you know, delicate and, and beautiful and also corseted and constrained <laughs> whenever necessary in certain ways. And the, and the glass house itself is a facade. The whole family dynamic, the narrative that they created is a facade. It is masking very, very real rot underneath. There is blood on all of their hands in order to maintain the life that they live, right? And going back to the allegory for colonialism. And so we wanted the, the wardrobe and the imagery and the beauty to mirror that that only as you got to know them and as you follow their journeys and their narrative arcs, do you realize just how much, you know, ugliness and rot is underneath the layers of this seeming like vision of, of beauty and an oasis, right? So it was, it was the playing with the expectation of what meets the eye as, 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 as a stranger coming in as an outsider and, and hopefully successfully subverting it. Um, and just to to speak a bit to the stained glass, and um, I mean, we were, we're both really interested in ritual as world building, and I think that's why it sort of has some some folk horror elements to it as as well. When we were thinking about um, how these women preserve memory through through craft, we initially were thinking like, should it be tapestries because that's you know the bio tapestry. This is throughout history how how women have have recorded events. Um, but obviously it being a glass house, it really lent itself to the, the stained art um, element. And we were so lucky to work with a local artist in PE, Charles Tate, who, who designed those windows for us. Um, Charlie, we love you, Charles. <laughs> love you, Charles. Um, so it, it just came together really beautifully with the, with the existing aesthetic that we, that we had there. But we liked this idea of painting and painting, painting and repainting the windows so that the, you know, so that history can be can be rewritten um, like that, and and ritual. I mean, the rituals we have in this movie are quite brutal. I mean, there's you know there's organs on the table, but ritual is really just whatever you do repeatedly that tells you who you are and reminds you, uh, attaches you to your culture. 
Um, and so we really wanted to create a sense of normalization around what they do, that um, what we see as murder as a viewer to them is, is housekeeping, you know, is, um, and so we wanted to create that sense of, of daily life. A chainsaw family. Yes. So I know it's very, it's very late there. I just want to give a call out to one of our Q and A's, Palm Yu, who says, I love you, Jess, two exclamation points. This project is so thrilling. And you did answer the question before, but I'll just put it out in the world. It's like, my question is, how did you prepare for the role for this film, which I believe that you answered, but I just wanted to, to get it out there that you got an I love you from the- from Oh, the well, I love you too. <laughs> Excellent. So um, as we wrap <laughs> things up, should we talk about like what's next for everybody? What's the next thing as we keep making movies during the plague? I also want to say not only is the glass house prophetic in many ways, but also, as we know, everyone during the pandemic just lived in their nightgowns. So you were also correct about that because I just lived in like yes. my leather daddy hat and like my vintage robe. And that's really that's amazing. amazing. How I live. We're lucky that like I, I I put all my gear on for now, but usually that's the. I mean, you didn't have to. We should have said, "Please be in your pajamas, like us." For oh my bad. <laughs> bad, like everybody else. I apologize, but let's let's start with uh, you, Kelsey. What is next? Um. Well, Greg and I are about to go on a bit of an adventure. <laughs> uh. No, we're 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 gearing up to enter um pre production on our next project, and I'm I'm so excited. All right, so then we're gonna go down to Greg. You, yes. Yeah, yeah okay, we've got to work out this technology, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, as Kelsey said, we're going on to the fix, which uh, starts next week in pre-production. Um, and again with Jess. And uh, then after that, we go on to another one. And if you thought Glasshouse was great, wait till you see the sows. And I carry you always. Um, coming from the twisted minds of Emma and Kelsey again. So those will come out about this time next year. So that, that's kind of where we're going at the moment. Um, the fix and then another two next year. Or the, the two next year are going to be very similar to Glass House with a slight twist. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. That means we move to the Jess box. So Jess... You work with these crazy characters again? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to working with these crazy people again. They have dark, twisted, crazy minds, and you know, you never know what to expect. So, I'm <laughs> looking forward to whatever they're gonna throw at me. Um, but yeah, what am I doing next? I guess I've I've wrapped up a, a couple other films. Um, waiting for some other bits to come out. Waiting for more of the world to see Glass House. And just getting fit so Kelsey can, you know, put me through hell on our next project. <laughs> Very exciting. Well, I mean, to be fair, Glasshouse was that process. Yeah, I think just to clarify, Jess and I met a couple of years ago when Jess did a tape for this project that's now about to go. Everything mm -hmm. in movie making land, as you well know, Heather, is it's it's always, yeah. it's never it's it's always far far more convoluted in real life than what it appears. Um, but but the project we're going into now was something I wrote eight years ago and is, is is now coming to life. And we were able to get in touch with Jess and be like, you know, do you want to tape for this other film? Thanks to thanks to the relationship we built on, on working mm -hmm. together on, on, on this one that we're about to go on. So Which, yeah. to be fair, Kelsey auditioned me when I was like, I was like, I was like just turned 19. I'm 22 now, and there's been like a whole pandemic. Like a lot has changed. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a second. It does. Very much. It does. Yeah. But every, you know, divine timing and whatnot, everything happens for a reason. If it hadn't been for COVID, this film might not have actually got shot in the way it did. So I love the idea. Of everything happens for a reason. I like, I love a divine timing. My, my day job, I'm a film producer, so I'll, I'll keep that in my heart. <laughs> you, you know exactly how it yes. is. <laughs> how long it takes yeah so, it's a um, miracle that anything gets made well i'm glad that glass house got made it's thank so you good. <laughs> thank you and uh emma so ah uh, a couple of
of exciting things. Um, there's obviously the the next two on the slate, and I just want to mention um, Fred Stradom, who's one of the other writers on that. On thank on you. Um, uh, but what I am working on at the moment, uh, I just got go ahead on an, another script. I'm 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 working on that is uh, a horror rom com. Um, it's kind of a rom com, but that's also about fem femicide in South Africa. So it's it's been a difficult one to write, but I just got it finished, and so I'm feeling excited about tackling it. all the easy topics. Yeah, always the easy stuff. Okay. Very Anyways, so that's, that's what I've got going on. So, Miss Kitty Harris, where shall we see you next in this world? Well, right now I'm just focusing on school, you know. Um, but um, I definitely, I think I want to be an actress when I'm older. So, yeah. You're already an actress, Kitty. Yeah, you're already Phenomenal an actress, one. Phenomenal, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're on your way, well on your way. <laughs> yes, and maybe future director, right? Oh, 100%. She yeah. is smart, a smart, smart, smart girl. Yeah, Kitty, I, I was going to say it, actually. I totally think you're going to end up directing one day. You have such a strong instinct, I, I think, um, let me know. Let me know if you want a script written and I'll write something for your first feature. <laughs> so Brett, Take advantage of that, Kitty. So, so Brett, where are we going to see you next? Yeah, so um, I'm working with a group of young creatives, uh, mostly student, uh, stu film students, um, about a, a far murder uh, short film. And that is a real horror in South Africa. So uh, not a big budget or anything, but um, there's a lot of people jumping in because they feel like they need to do this. And yeah, it's, it's going to be a, just a concept and then they're going to try making it a feature film. But shout out to all the farmers in South Africa. Our hearts are with you. Yeah. And Miss Anya. The matriarch of this crazy family. <laughs> Where are we going to see you? Um, yeah, also, like Jess said, just waiting for for things. <laughs> Obviously, everything's slowed down a lot. Um, auditions are scarce. Um, but I do have a small role coming up um, in a new film next year. It's uh, still, still in post-production um called redeeming love um which is awesome i got to work with some great international actors on that um but yeah other than that kind of just yeah seeing uh what the world what the world will throw at me next uh not in any rush <laughs> like i said everything slowed down so i'm just focusing on myself i'm doing a lot of voice work doing a lot of singing and things on the side keeping myself busy um so yeah all right so as we close out this incredible Q&A for this incredible movie, Glass House, to all the ships at sea, this is what you must do. If you love this film, you're obsessed with this film, you love these people, other than hiring them for everything else in the world, you need to go on social media and you go, I love these films, I love these actors, I love these creators, I love these producers, and you hashtag them and you put it on the world because that's how independent movies get to every place in the world, is through your love and through your word of mouth. So it's very important. And so thank you everyone for being part of this Q&A, the Q&A for Glass House. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Heather. Thank you so, so much, thank Heather. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thank Heather. you for the wonderful questions and the, and the excuse guys. for this little reunion from bed. Yay. It was wonderful to see all your beautiful faces. And Heather, yeah, thank you so much. Yes, it's very late. You guys should go sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.